Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. On the show today, I have Rafe Kelly. So Rafe is the founder of Evolve, Evolve Move Play. He has a rich background in parkour, all kinds of martial arts. Um, I'm always seeing awesome pictures of him climbing up trees and running across beaches and doing all kinds of fun movement stuff. So looking forward to today. Rafe, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm excited to, to join you for the podcast. And where are you joining us today from? I'm uh, based in Seattle, Washington. Oh, nice, nice. I haven't been out there for a long time. So um, let's start at the beginning. How did you get interested in the body and in movement? I guess as a small child, I um, I lived in a alternative kind of hippie community, got a lot of opportunity to move. I ended up being homeschooled from um, fourth grade through my sophomore year in high school. So I spent a lot of time outside climbing and running. Older brother, a uh, cousin across the road that we did a lot of uh, sword fighting, a lot of roughhousing, a lot of throwing apples at each other, lots of climbing trees in the woods. Um, got interested in martial arts very early. I was six years old. Um, I had a mentor who worked with me who, who I roughhoused a lot with and got a lot of uh, out of that with him. Um, started doing some sort of strength and conditioning stuff when I was 12. Uh, gymnastics I became interested in when I was 15. Started training gymnastics when I was 15. So I think it's kind of a lifelong pursuit for me. Uh, when I was 20, I decided to become a gymnastics coach and really make that my focus when I was 21 um, or 20, yeah, around there. And then when I discovered parkour, it was like someone had ripped a layer off of gymnastics and shown me the thing that I was really interested in that was underneath the gymnastics. And so I was super passionate about that. And that was uh, 12 years ago. So, so after that, it was very much, you know, kind of my focus in life uh, entirely. Great. And now you're kind of making a living coaching people, doing workshops, traveling around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I did, uh, let's say nine workshops this year. I chopped my schedule down a little bit, uh, cause I wanted to, to focus on building some other aspects of the business. It was 13 the year before traveled, uh, to Australia, Europe, all over the States. Um, next year we'll be adding Africa and Asia to my, uh, my touring list. Um, so yeah, it's been really cool. It's been really fun to to get an opportunity to, to share this work with people all over the world. Great. Well, just a bit of context here. So a few years ago, people started sending me videos of guys like Ido Patel and people doing movement stuff. And they said, Mark, you're going to really like this, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I started looking into it. And then a few of my students started going to workshops. So I uh, was doing a workshop in Amsterdam and all these guys turned up and they're all doing like crazy handstands and arm balances. And, you know, they're really into movement as movement as a thing rather than a particular art. And then I came across a few podcasts and, you know, lots of cool videos online, your stuff, a guy in uh, Norway. I've got Chandler Stevens coming on. We've got the f a load of my students started uh, training with the fighting monkey people. We've got those guys coming on as well. Oh, and, just, and just recently, I just got really interested in this idea of, you know, I don't even know if it has a name. Is it like movement or move natural or movement culture? Say a little bit about this field, which is really quite recently evolved as a thing. Let's go back a little bit. If you go back to the origins of parkour, actually, mm -hmm. I think it was actually very parallel to what's happening now. They were researching and exploring in a very large spectrum of movements, and that was happening in the late 1980s, early 1990s. So they were they were doing the jumps and everything that has kind of parkour has become known for. But they were also practicing martial arts. A lot of them did Dia Vo Dao, which is um, Vietnamese kung fu, because the Bell family who started parkour are, are Vietnamese and. And they come from that background. So there's a lot of that. Uh, they were also practicing b-boy and they were doing handstands. They were doing acrobatics. They were doing gymnastics. A lot of them had a gymnastics background. So parkour actually comes from this very open movement culture that eventually everyone got really focused on the jumps and saw the way that they were jumping and flipping at height and between buildings. And that kind of became the iconic, iconic aspect of parkour. So that's the actually thing that, just to jump in. That's the thing that people may have seen on a kind of TV advert or a kind of James Bond movie or something that kind of running and jumping from the buildings, but you're saying it kind of comes from something much wider than that. Yeah. I mean, so the parkour was originally called l'art du déplacement, which means basically means the art of moving. It's, it's kind of the same term, right? And then parkour was the other one, which is the obstacle course. And that, that aspect of it kind of grew more. 
But if you look at the guys who started it, um, the Yamakaze side of it, they're, they're very well-developed across a very broad range of activities. Uh, Williams Bell in particular uh, is a great dancer as well. Um, so that, that, that thing was maybe around. And then there was this argument about the parkour community about what it was. And you know, some people were saying, let's start a movement. So then myself, like I got really interested in, in the idea of, of natural movement in the sense of how does a human being move so as to, to best match with its evolved nature? That's, that's really the fundamental question to me. It's like, well, movement's a great field, but um, it's, it's, it's literally infinite and there's no orientation. There's no place to start unless you start with, an, with some basic priors about human nature from my perspective. So then, uh, so then, you know, parkour went and did its thing and, and then kind of, uh, within that developed the natural movement thing. So move Nat, most people don't know this, but move Nat actually kind of gestated within the parkour community. So, uh, parkour was perhaps in part, uh, inspired by an older French art of movement called uh, Méthode Naturelle. And Méthode Naturelle was developed by a French soldier and physical educator, Georges Hubert. And he believed basically that, you know, human beings needed to express all of these essential physical capacities that we evolved for, walking, running, jumping, climbing, moving on all fours, lifting, thro- uh, lifting throwing, balancing, uh, self-defense, and swimming. Okay, so it's a very, very complete movement art. So then... Uh, there were the founder of MoveNet, Erwan, was advocating early on in the parkour community. He was training parkour to some degree and had kind of he was moving around in that community and he was advocating for the, the growth of this. And I had uh, had a, a similar idea basically, which was that when I had first experienced parkour, again, it's like you ripped this layer off gymnastics. And as soon as you did that, well, I had been out of training martial arts for a while and I wanted to go back to training martial arts as soon as I started training parkour because it was like it didn't seem complete to me. It's a great art. It's a really a powerful discipline as it's commonly practiced, but it seemed to leave some sort of question about the completeness of a move of a movement athlete. And so I was interested in this back in 2006. I wanted to create a, well, I was a, an evolutionary biology and anthropology student, and I wanted to uh, combine the martial arts I'd done, the strength and conditioning I'd done and the parkour and the gymnastics to, to, to do something that was I thought of them as warrior arts. Like we had evolved to be these these warriors, and I was reading epic literature and thinking about like Cúchulainn, and uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever read any Irish mythology, but uh, all the Irish myth- mythological heroes have these feats that they do, which are basically mm. like parkour stunts. Cúchulainn had the salmon leap. We don't know, really know what that was, but maybe it was a corkscrew. Who knows? Mm. So, 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 anyways, I was interested in that question, and then uh, Erwin and I started to collaborate a little bit, and eventually we split ways and he went and developed MoveNet and I went and focused on the parkour community for a while. While I was doing that, uh, someone who read my writing and who'd actually brought me down for a, a seminar to teach uh, at his gym, the, the owner of CrossFit Portland, Scott Hagnes, uh, sent me a message and said he had Ido Portal coming into town. And uh, that was 2011. And so he said, you know, I should really just come down and, and take the seminar and, and check it out because it might be really interesting. So I did. And, and, you know, Ido had articulated very beautifully his own idea about movement culture. And it, it definitely kind of, it tied some, some ideas together that were still floating in my head around what it was to be a mover. And it, it seemed to be very in line with, with the ideas of natural movement. So then Ido has obviously since then he's exploded. So he's, you know, uh, especially since he, uh, I think he had like 40,000 fans on Facebook before he started working with, or maybe 70,000 fans on Facebook before he started working with, with, uh, McGregor. Conor McGregor, but now, yeah, it's, McGregor. now it's like, you know, who knows, maybe it's a million. I can't remember the last time I checked, but it's, it's some ridiculous number. So for the most part, most people's perception of movement culture is, uh, is sort of conditioned on what's coming out from Ido and his students and the people who are, are really devotees of his. But my perspective on it is a little bit different. I think of movement culture as, as kind of any of these, these arts of movement or these approaches to movement that people have been developing that are aimed at a generalist f- kind of yeah. frame, like how do we do that? And so, or you could even think of movement culture as a, as a really broad umbrella and say that, that every, every culture that that's oriented towards movement, whether it's yoga or dance or whatever could be considered 
part of a broader movement culture. And then there's the question of how do we kind of create a generalist movement culture or create the optimal movement culture. This is what I see as independently kind of arising in different places, you know, coming out of parkour, particularly I'm hearing, and I'm just learning about this, so excuse my ignorance on this, but also like in the yoga world, you know, there's, there's this kind of movement of being a slightly more free in kind of yoga and not being limited to the kind of basic movements. And, you know, in martial arts, it was all very separate at one point and MMA came along, things kind of came together. And, you know, things like Sistema got popular, which I know you've done as well, where, where it's people are really looking at a lot more freedom within that rather than just a very limited number of moves or katas or forms. And, um, you know, I wonder if civilization, on the one hand, we've got increasing specialization since kind of several thousand years BC, and it's got to a point where people are very specialized in what they do, and there's that urge for generality and for the kind of things that put us back in touch with ourselves just as human beings. Like, you know, the first time I saw a course on climbing trees, I thought this is fucking stupid, you know, like climbing trees is what, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't need a course on that. And it's just what kids do. And then I thought, no, that's exactly where we've got to that people are sitting at desks all day. I've had a very uncomfortable three hours at a desk this afternoon, which is mm-hmm. unusual for me. And I feel awful, you know, I'm like, God, yeah. I need to get out of that after this interview. And, um, people have got to the point where they do need to do some courses on uh, wrestling with their friends and scrambling up slopes and climbing trees and play. You know, I've done courses in play recently and it seems mm-hmm. like that urge to get back to the most basic things of running and climbing and fighting and, you know, the simplest things uh, away from the specialization of a gym, which says there's this machine and it isolates this muscle uh, and, you know, and if you do it exactly right, it will isolate it the best and then you'll get that muscle grow. It definitely seems like a, a movement across many, many disciplines, which is kind of coming together in the, in the sort of stuff you're doing. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, when I was working with, with Erwan back in 2007, it kind of felt like nobody was really thinking about this. The closest thing that I could that I could find was was CrossFit, which was really advocating this mix of gymnastics and powerlifting and Olympic lifting and, and track and field elements and swimming and rowing and kind of putting it all together. And actually, the early days of CrossFit were were much more skill dominant. Like there were wads where you had to do you know back roll to handstand and uh, kind of complex gymnastic skills. And then it's been, in some sense, it's been dumbed down and from my perspective since then. But, but there was actually more of a movement competence aspect of CrossFit in the beginning. So I was kind of active on that forum trying to, trying to advocate for these ideas then, but it, it really seemed like people just didn't get it. Um, and then when I popped my head back up with Evolve Move Play four years ago, it was like people were coming out of the woodwork thinking about these ideas. You know, uh, I really like Simon Thacker. I think you may be having him on your podcast as well. He's yeah. from... Uh, yep. He's from the UK or from Australia and he's been uh, really investigating the same type of ideas for a long time, very independently on his own. Uh, yeah, what like of his... Israel, Australia, Germany, England, yeah. a little bit, West Coast, definitely, like States. It seems like it's popped up earlier as a sort of, you know, I'm pretty excited by it, you know, and, I, and, I've, and I've, it's, this is one reason I'm interviewing some of you guys on the show is I just want to learn about it. It's like, it feels like yeah. it's hot to me, like in terms of being in the zeitgeist. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I just got a message from Israel about a, a dancing group that has really been taking on the idea of natural movement. They wanted me to come over and do, uh, uh, and come and uh, do a seminar that they're doing over there, which unfortunately conflicts with my schedule, but, but it's really cool to see like lots of people are definitely taking on this idea. It's like the, the way that I tend to think of it is like, you imagine culture as a river. Well, when you have like a current one way, if you have a really strong current, then sometimes it'll get trapped on something that creates a counter current, right? And it feels like, well, the broad river of our culture has been towards specialization for a really long time. And it's becoming more and more apparent that that, uh, that that's great for productivity. Like I, yeah. I tend to think that we in the West, we've, we've solved the problem of material affluence to a really significant in degree like not completely there are yeah, still lots like of people living under a dollar day, culture like, yeah yeah and and it's not just us like people tend to think that the west is only rich because we're stealing it from other people but that's just not the case like we're enriching the whole globe with our capitalist system like something like two hundred thirty-five thousand people a day are lifted out of uh, poverty extreme poverty every day 
Yeah, it's the, it's the least poverty there's ever been, the least slavery there's ever been, the least, you know, not to say the world's perfect, but, the, you know, I think we're going to upset some of our listeners. You've, I've seen you liking some of my slightly more conservative <laughs> libertarian posts of late, right? Yeah. So uh, just want to warn all my lefty hippie audience, just breathe, keep calm. It's going to be okay, but there, there might be some discussion here. Yeah, so so I don't I don't say this to say, you know, the West is perfect. Um, but I think it's important that people kind of have a little bit of a balanced perspective because I do think there's some really big problems that we have in the West that we, we haven't solved, but it's really useful to recognize what we have solved in, in order to, to kind of also some understand fucking, some fucking gratitude. We don't have to go back many generations between your grandparents and my grandparents. Like my granddad was an Irish fisherman. He had a yeah. tough life, you know, yeah, like man. it was, and my dad was the first generation that went to university. That was special for him in that family. And that was most people like Irish peasants. That was most of the world. Right. Like he's like, yeah. he was like impressed that I had a business and his son went to university. That was a big deal. And it was only a very small percentage of people who, uh, you know, had the kind of privileges we have to travel around the world doing workshops and learning about things like movement fucking culture. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so my kind of goal is like, okay, well, well, let's not throw the bat- a baby out with the bathwater. But also, it's like I don't think that the broad spectrum of people are going to be very willing to give up the values that Western. Um, civilization capitalism has gained. And I think, you know, people in all of the developing world, they're trying to grab that stuff as fast as they can. But there's a set of costs that are associated with the benefits that we've developed. And we need to, we need to kind of start being a lot more thoughtful about how we ameliorate the costs that are driven by the same system that's, that's giving us these benefits. That's, that's the fundamental kind of perspective that I have. So I think that we are really great in the West at taking care of objective well-being, And that's awesome. But despite the fact that we've increased objective well-being to heights never seen before to amounts of people never seen before we're actually really miserable um our subjective well-being is terrible yeah the mental health addiction suicide rates all these things are, are actual record highs aren't they despite the fact that kind of like you know our, our nutrition our, our physical safety the number of people dying in wars that's all at record lows so there is this big yeah. discrepancy between the the, the subjective and objective here. Yeah, Louis C.K., who's a really controversial figure just at the moment, but he said this thing that that stuck in my head. He said, everything is awesome and nobody's happy. Yeah. And so it's like we, it's not that we want everything to be shit again, <laughs> but we want to learn how to be happy even despite our affluence. So we need to recognize what it is about the system that we created that's tending to take people away from happiness. And I think that the fundamental thing is, is, is the isolation of the individual and the specialization of the individual. It's like capitalism tends to run well on making very specific cogs out of individuals. So it's like you are, if we can specialize your function to the, like the fewest tasks that you can do, and then we can move you around anywhere in order to do that, then you're going to be the most efficient tool for the generation of capital. The problem with that is that the thing that gives human beings self-worth is being broadly competent and feeling like they are of value to a community that's meaningful to them. And so we're stripping all that away, right? You don't have community because if you're attached to the people who are near you, then you're not willing to go take a job a thousand miles away. And we don't have broad skills because it's not economically productive for you yeah, to know how to sew. Factory. That's Adam Smith's pin factory. You want to make it as specialist as possible and have one person being real, really good at a small part of the pin factory, right? That's the basis of the whole sort of factory system. Exactly. So, so we face this, this central problem that everybody is... I guess the way that I've said it is that we're the most we're the most competent civilization in history in some sense, and yet we are made up of the least competent set of human beings that have ever existed. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I, another comedian once said, "I think uh, everyone knows more and more about less and less. The end point is when uh, <laughs> when everyone will know everything about nothing." Um, so that's kind of the direction that we're going. So I think what's happening in some very broad sense is that people are recognizing that that they can't satisfy their own kind of humanity by just being a, a career, whatever that career is. It's like, you got to specialize in your career, but it's like, you have to go out and then become a human being on top of that. And a human being that has broad scale competencies and is, and is networked into communities that are meaningful to you. And I think that's, that's fundamentally maybe the question that, that the movement culture is, is arising from. And, and we're just recognizing the, 
the limitations of, of reductionism. Reductionism has been yeah. incredibly powerful, but, but even within the scientific community, there's, there's more and more recognition that for specific types of problems, reductionism is, is not, is, doesn't actually allow you to do it. So out of the ecology community comes a, 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 a system of thinking called dynamic systems theory. And that's actually now starting to trickle into the strength and conditioning research. So I'm reading a book by Franz Bosch now called um, Strength and Coordination and Integrated Approach. It's basically about understanding how the body operates as a system of systems. The interesting thing is that for me, reading it from my perspective, basically what he's talking about ends up saying like, it ends up reading, it's a very dense and difficult book, but if you, if you can glean the information from it, it's, it's basically like you can't isolate things nearly as well as you think you can. And your nervous system wants to be good at things. It evolved to be good at the things that are, that make it good across many skill domains. So the best way that you can gain patterns that are really strong and help you accomplish many different things is to train in many different aspects of sport, right? This is the same things coming out of the strength conditioning or the, the, yeah. sport. and if we see a modern gym, it's a real reflection of kind of modern industrial reductionist culture, isn't it? So you talk, you know, even adverts for gym stuff, it's like you're a machine, the body's a machine. You're trying to isolate muscles. You're on your machine. It's like a kind of factory conveyor belt. There's these kind of linear, very limited movements. It's kind of like, you know, it seems part of the same kind of system of keeping people stupid, if, if, if I'm honest, when I go to a gym. And I, I went to a gym recently, like a couple of years ago for a year or two just to lift weights. And it was, you know, it's easier than buying all the weights myself. I didn't have space at home. And, and it was like, wow, this is a real different culture in a gym compared to a dojo or a dance floor. I'd spent most of my kind of movement education on, you know, you know, you know Aikido dojos and tango dance floors and fire rhythms dance floors. And it was like, like, wow, this the gym culture is really, really different. And I don't want to get too snobby about that because you know gyms have their place, and there's there's some good. You know, I enjoyed lifting weights there, but it was real clear that the movement patterning being done was also part of the kind of psychological patterning. Yeah, you know, we. It's interesting how the way that we think in one field tends to affect other fields, right? It's like there's there's a zeitgeist, and reductionism has been incredibly powerful. And then we, I guess, over the last maybe 60, 70 years, we're really starting to see where it fails, where it doesn't work. So one of the early ones is uh, that I like to point out is uh, nutrientism. So early on when we first started isolating out all of the different, the different elements of uh, the different elements of, of what's in food. So carbohydrates, fats, proteins, the different amino acids that make up proteins, the different vitamins, the different minerals. There was this idea, scientists had this idea that, that maybe we could start to design a human diet based on testing for what the optimum level of these things was. And then we could, we could formulate foods that were healthier for you. So Wonder Bread comes out, right? And Wonder Bread's fortified with 14 different vitamins and minerals. And the idea is this is, this is scientifically healthy, right? This is designed by science, right? This is 10% of or 20% of yeah. this vitamin that you need. We've worked it out and this is a, a percentage of that. Exactly. So then, then you end up, you know, the kind of the, the most extreme and crazy version of this is so, uh, doctors started telling women that formula was going to be healthier than breast milk. And that turned out to be total bullshit. Like we, we were not smarter than evolution. We were not smarter than the natural environment. And the evidence seems to indicate that maybe something like, uh, being breastfed as opposed to uh, as opposed to formula fed was like adding five to seven points to your IQ score. Wow. So there's something really missing, and uh, so that may you know that there may be a genetic confound there, but but there's a, a profound observation that that we can't just replace natural systems easily and then we've that's broadly what everybody in the health and fitness community understands now is that you need whole foods in order to be healthy and i think that we're just discovering the same thing in movement that you can't isolate everything out and i think the same philosophy that gave us wonder bread is what gave us nautilus machines yeah. the idea that the best way to to develop something is to break it into a bunch of pieces and build all the pieces. And how do you possibly, yeah. like if you think of, let's say, what you guys call rough housing, we don't actually call it that in the UK, that's kind of like kind of play fighting, wrestling, yeah. uh, like, like the amount of different muscles and different types of movement involved in that is just so much more than you could possibly replicate with, with a machine. Yeah, one of my basic heuristics in training is actually that you should train at the highest level of complexity 
in which you can derive whatever adaptive pathway you're trying to train, right? So there's always a, whenever you're in a more complex environment, there's a potential that you can compensate away from whatever you're trying to train. So you have to be aware of that. But if you can, if you know that you're able to get the adaptive response that you want at a given level of complexity, you never want to go more, less complex than that because you're always getting more adaptive response from a more complex system. So if you think about rough and tumble play, it's like, well, you're getting stronger in your body, right? Physiologically, you're getting stronger. And then you could say you're developing better coordination and you're, you're, you're developing all the motor maps throughout your body much more effectively. So that's like, okay, well, here's, here's some things that are not happening when you're lifting weights, right? They're not happening. And yeah. then you could say, well, actually, you're also learning to negotiate and communicate effectively with another person. And you're also learning rhythm and sensitivity. And it's like, well, okay, all the benefits all of a sudden stack yeah. up. And it's like, if you wanted a workout that isolated all of those benefits, you'd take you forever. You couldn't yeah. possibly even just go through all the positions that you're going to get in a wrestling match and build a workout out of, out yeah. of all of them. And in terms of the psychological side, obviously this is embodiment podcast. We're interested in the body kind of here, but most listeners, it's kind of body mind, particularly, you know, something like uh, tree climbing, you're looking at, okay, do I want to take a risk right now? You know, you're looking at, okay, what's my, am, is this actually an okay risk? And am I just scared? And how do I manage my fear? Am I getting competitive with that other guy who's further up the tree, even though their limbs are a foot longer than mine? And, you know, actually that's, that's different for them. Like, you know, with the wrestling, it's like, hey, I remember as a kid, like, oh, shit, I've gone too far. I've really hurt my friend. Or, you know, like, hey, this guy is really being unpleasant to me and I need to actually have to stop the wrestling and talk to him and say, look, don't do that, you know? So there's all sorts of kind of psychosocial skills that are taught within, embedded within these activities. Absolutely. That's, that's a huge aspect of, of what we're doing. And, and what I'm recognizing more and more is that what, uh, what a lot of people are looking for is, is some of these other things. They're looking for a place to, to cultivate themselves. Like I, I've came up with this idea that, that essentially the, the, the best aim of movement practice is the cultivation of the most heroic version of yourself. It's like, it's a, it's a laboratory for your character. That's really what it is. Nice. We just talked about how a senior martial art, ninth degree black belt and karate on talking about saying, look, it's not really about fighting, it's character development. That's what the Japanese were getting at with these. And I, I think things like extreme sports and movement culture in the West, it's like we're almost developing our own Western Budo, our own Western character development system. And that, that's what seems to be emerging, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting area for me right now. Well, one, one thing I think about when we talk about the, the evolution of this is like older systems of Kung Fu basically contain everything that we're doing, right? You can, you can go, well, obviously Jackie Chan, right? Jackie Chan comes not out of Kung Fu, he comes out of Beijing Opera. But his training involved being able to kick and jump and punch and choreograph and clown and, you know, like any number of things. I like to go back to watch old Jackie Chan movies and just pick out like, this could be the origin of any number, like, oh, there's where animal flow comes from. <laughs> there's where parkour comes from. There's where locomotion comes from. There's where, you know, whatever it is, it's like whatever people are doing now that's the hippest thing in movement culture. It's like Jackie Chan's doing it as a stunt in some movie. And it is years. kind of funny that it's hip though, isn't it? Like I was watching, is it Thomas from Norway? And they're kind of rolling around on the ground doing kind of Aikido rolls. And I'm thinking, what the yeah. fuck? I've been doing that for 20 years in Aikido, you know? And then, but then they do something else and they go, okay, I have no idea what that is. Cause it's so much broader, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you know, we've turned wrestling with kids into a thing and climbing trees into a thing. And, part of me thinks that's kind of silly and part of me thinks like, okay, this is exactly what we need. And often it has some quite slick branding around it, real cool social media videos, um, you know, be like you jumping across some uh, beautiful rocks or a cool beach somewhere, you know, it's like, it's, uh, Ido, Ido Patel also had some very slick videos. It feels like the kind of marketing is part of it, but then there's also this genuine longing people have if nothing else, just to have fun with their bodies, right? Like it's not fun in a gym. People aren't playing. People aren't fooling around. And I see with like the, the videos of your courses, it looks like, wow, that looks really fun. I want to be there with those guys. Yeah. So let me say a word on, uh, on the idea that this stuff is silly. So yes, every kid used to do this, right? But every kid used to do parkour too, right? Every kid used to run and jump and climb, but nobody used to do parkour the way that kids do parkour today. So the fact that people can do something without any instruction doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile to develop and cultivate it into an art. 
That's number one. And then number two is like, well, in a, at a time when people are losing something, having people who are actively researching and developing that thing is incredibly value, uh, valuable. So it's like, you know, you might look at parkour and be like, well, why do people have to get taught parkour? I used to jump over things when I was a kid. And it's like, well, you couldn't jump over things the way these guys jump over. <laughs> yeah, not at that level. Yeah. And, and, and the furthermore, the kids today aren't jumping over those things. So it's like somebody needs to reclaim this aspect of our culture. So I actually think there's a benefit to that, though. It's like when we take something that's sort of basic to human nature and we, and we cultivate it, one, it's, oftentimes it's the best stuff to cultivate because it's deeply rooted in you. So you can get more out of it right? It's like, okay, everyone used to tree climb. Well, everyone used to tree climbing because your body evolved to tree climb for 90 million years. Hmm. And if you want to recognize the, if you want to build your nervous system to be better at understanding the, the best principles of movement, well, your whole system was evolved to move in that environment. So you're going to, you're going to, you're going to pick things up and it's incredibly variable. And the most agile animals in the world are arboreal animals. So it's like, actually there's a ton of stuff there. And then when you cultivate it deeply, you get something that's not the same as the way that kids used to climb trees. It's like everybody can fight, right? If you, if you throw somebody into a physical confrontation, people are going to throw their fists around. They're going to scream. They're going to kick. They're going to bite. Right. But they can't fight like MMA fighters. No, they can't fight. Well, that's all. Most people will do a vertical kind of strike like this in a very tense, crude way. It's, it's, so would yeah. you rather have a deeply cultivated art of, of, of physical culture, right? Or, you know, another one is sex. It's like, man, everybody figures that shit out to some degree, but just about everybody is in a situation where if they put thought into it and if they went and studied a tradition that offers heuristics about how to do it better, then they could have a better sex life. Oh, there's there's, and, def, there's definite sex cultures around the world as well in, yeah. in 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 terms of sort of skill in different areas and certain cultures that have tradition uh, have uh, preserved or developed sexuality in different ways. Yeah. I can I can say that for sure. Look, you know, you can you can become multi orgasmic as a man, but how many men do you think stumble onto that by accident? Not very many. Mm. So do you want to you're like, well, fuck it, I, I can fuck. Or do you want to be like, I can, I'm going to learn to do, do that shit better than anybody. Why not? <laughs> There's a very sort of male very kind of urge there, isn't it? To get better and better at everything. And yeah. it seems like kind of like a lot of what you're saying is grounded in an appreciation of evolution and where we come from. Yeah, and absolutely. I want to get onto that because that is almost, it's almost taboo now in certain circles to talk about certain things being natural or, you know, we live in a world which has decided that everything's socially constructed. And uh, mm -hmm. A, that's just not my experience. And, and B, it's not logical. I mean, we do have an evolutionary heritage. That's, that's for sure. And there's something about going back to the body which actually connects us to this evolutionary heritage, whether it's fighting or running or jumping or climbing trees, in a world which says, no, everything's socially constructed. It's all cultural. There's no, there's no biology there. And that, it just seems like that's gone way too far recently, particularly in the States. So I'd love you to speak a bit to that. Okay. So that's, that's a real personal passion that's sort of outside. Well, to some degree it's outside of my professional life, but, um, I, I was an anthropology student and anthropology is sort of ground zero for the social construction view of human nature. And I, I grew up in a very liberal kind of hippie community. So I, I really grew up, I think with the idea that, that for instance, boys and girls are basically the same and that culture just, just, uh, that culture builds them into different things. And so when I was uh, 19, my older brother had a, a son and um so i was watching him grow up and then around the same time i was teaching gymnastics i was teaching little boys and i was teaching little girls and i was taking these these, these social constructionist classes in anthropology um that were we had a like we'd had a class called sex and gender across culture and it was basically it's a very strange class the entire thing was about third genders so like, well that's interesting that's great um it's good to, it's good for people to know about that but like 99.7 percent of people are cisgendered and 95 to 97 percent of people are heterosexual so maybe we could have some information in the class about how heterosexual rules vary across cultures and how people negotiate relationships between heterosexual cisgendered men and women because that might provide some insight that would be helpful to the 97 percent of people in this class yep now giving people empathy with 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 third genders, that's really valuable. But does it, is that the entire study of sex and gender across culture? Is that what it should be oriented towards? That seemed very strange to me. And then 
and then I took a, a sociobiology class or evolutionary psychology, sociobiology right around the same time. And they were like, no, like there are cross-cultural universal patterns of, of masculine and feminine behavior. Most of the curves overlap, right? So uh, I'll give you an example, which is off the top of my head, but I, I know you've been a fan of Jordan Peterson as well, but Jordan Peterson is a, is a big influence on mine right now. He talks about the fact that uh, you know, he studies the big five personality characteristics. One yep. of those is agreeability. Yep. So m- women are more agreeable than men on average. Agreeability is basically your tendency to to want to empathize with people and your tendency to be polite towards them. So, uh, so women are more agreeable than men. So how much more agreeable are they? Well, if you take any two random, a random set of men and women and you, and you guess that the woman is more agreeable, you'll be right 60% of the time, but you'll be wrong 40% of the time. So there's a substantial overlap in the characteristic. But when you, when you average that across big groups, it's like yeah. if you want to select a bunch of very agreeable people, and if you look at the people at the very end of the spectrum, almost all the most agreeable people are women. Almost all the most disagreeable people are men, which is one of the major reasons why the majority of the prison population is male. So, it's the same as muscle mass or height or anything else. Yeah. There are tall women and there are super muscly women, and the same you know there are shorter guys or skinnier guys. But those two things, on average, there is a big difference. And you know, there's a reason that every single sport in the Olympics has you know male and female competitors. And the, 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 the speeds, uh, the heights, the weights lifted are radically different for those two groups with the exception of ultra marathons. I think it's the only one that, it, the only the ultra long distance ones, they even come close. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the average is somewhere between 10 to 15% difference in performance across almost every sport that we look at. Um, and I actually think that that may be somewhat less I think that the average in the, the general population may be actually larger than that because most people in the elite sports performance community are on performance enhancing drugs and performance enhancing drugs are variations on male hormones and it, you get a stronger women respond more strongly to male hormones than men do because they have less in their system intrinsically. So it's actually much easier to improve a woman's performance by giving her steroids than a man's performance. So, so we may actually be, the the gap may be even a little bit larger than that, but, uh, let me, I wanted to go, go to this idea. Well, when you start combining traits, then the variation gets, gets, gets really big, right? Like uh, if you look at any single trait, there's a lot of overlap, but then when you combine traits, there's not much overlap, right? So I'm six foot one, right? So that's, I think it's like the 90th percentile for a man. It's like the 99.7th percentile for a woman but I've met quite a few women who are as tall as me or taller than me. So then I weigh 210 pounds. Okay. So again, that's way up there in the percentiles for a woman. And, and so I've, I've met women who are heavier than me, right? There's a lot of obese people in this country. I, 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 I have met women who are taller and heavier than me, but then let's say, you know, I'm like 15% body fat. So have I've never met a woman who's six foot one and over 200 pounds and 15% body fat or less, right? Right away, it just takes three characteristics and then there's a complete separation. And then the body mass distribution, right? I have much more muscle in my upper body compared to a woman. So, so all of a sudden, like, you're not gonna, it, it's gonna be very hard to find a woman who's going to be, say, a comparable type of person for the performance of martial arts. They're not gonna have a head that's as big. They're not gonna have shoulders that are as wide. You can find a woman who's as tall as me. You can find a woman who's as heavy as me. But putting all those things together becomes really difficult. And people don't realize that. So it's like if you, if you, if you put together the probabilities across all those different personalities, most people end up actually very cleanly separated into either a, a feminine or masculine type of personality or physicality. So, uh, so there's a, there's a, I think it's a really big problem. You know, I'm... I'm not one of those people who thinks that there needs to be 50% representation everywhere all the time. Like I think that, I think it's nice sometimes to be in spaces that are just male. I think it's nice for women to be in spaces that are just female. I think that there are, there are kind of tasks that are better accomplished by a group of men and tasks that are better accomplished by a group of women. But I like teaching women and I've learned an enormous amount from them. I feel like, uh, there's, there's a, um, yeah, my mind is more masculine by nature. And so there's a lot of value to me in, in teaching women because in working with women, because they, because I have to stretch harder. I have to Mm -hmm. learn things about myself. I have to develop my empathy better. 
And my female students say to me, we want to see more women, right? We want to see more women in this sport. We want to see more women in parkour. It's been a, the parkour community, I guess, is about 13% female. Isn't that, there's, there's a huge difference in risk taking across genders there. And there's really good evolutionary reasons for that. Right. Yeah. In terms of kind of like you can have one guy and he can impregnate the whole tribe, but in women can only get pregnant once. So if a few young males get killed, you know, running after Buffalo or jumping off buildings or whatever, the latest risk taking fun thing for them to prove their courage is, then yeah, and, but it doesn't matter for the tribe. Yeah. And, and the death of an individual woman is more, problematic for the tribe than the death of an individual man because you know your your the reproductive capacity of the tribe is limited by the number of females it's also limited by the number of males but you have to kill way more men where you before you reach a limitation factor and i had something that blew my mind the other day it took me a while to really get my head around it people might not believe this at first the astounding fact i heard was that you do not have an equal number of male and female ancestors yeah uh, I wish I could uh, cite the paper that this is based on because there is a paper that it's based on. So the, the, the statistics seem to show that the, the effective population of your male ancestors is half the size of the effective population of your female ancestors. So, um, that doesn't sound like it can be right, but then when you think about, okay, so if, if, if the average woman has one child and the average man has either zero or two, then it starts to make more sense. <laughs> yeah. Peterson says that a lot. And uh, that, that one bothers me because, um, because if the average woman has one child, then you half your population every generation. Of course. I mean, it's it's just has, simple numbers. It's not. <laughs> the average female has to have at least two children. And generally, it's about two and a half children, but whatever. So the average man has zero or five or somewhere in there. But yeah, so uh, this is not really that surprising because, you know, Genghis Khan, the Y chromosome associated with Genghis Khan's lineage is shared by 6% of Asian males. Right? That's, that's some good fucking... Yeah. So we, we know that there are these giant lineages of, of men, right? The, like my, my Y chromosome is R1, uh, R1B. So that uh, it's R1B, M122, something like that. Uh, so R1B is associated with the expansion of the Yamnaya culture, which is uh, the Indo-Europeans. And they spread all, all throughout, uh, all throughout um, Europe and India. And they largely replaced the Y chromosomes of everyone who was there before them. Like there's very few Y chromosomes that were common in Europe that exist in Europe still, in, particularly in Northern Europe, that predate that. And there, and so there's this, like it's called a star-shaped phylogeny. Basically, it's like a few founding populations had enormous numbers of offspring, and then everybody in the next few generations descends from them. And then uh, the the Y chromosome. Sp- the, the M1 to something uh, aspect of my Y chromosome specifically appears to be related to the expansion of the Uniel lineage in Northern Ireland that became the High Kings of Ireland. So, so at multiple points in time, this lineage expanded and, and ended up in power and were able to have many more children. The reproductive potential of the average male or, or, of a male is, is in the, the hundreds or thousands. The reproductive potential of a female is in the tens, right? So, so men, if they reach a very high level of success, they can have far more children. There was another paper that came out about this recently. They showed that like the most successful hunter forger men have maybe 15 to 18 children. It's a different successful- kind of gambling. It's a different kind of gambling, isn't it? Like, yeah. like different odds and stake. My wife gambles a lot. And she talks about like odds and stake, you know? So it's like yeah. a bigger stake, but smaller odds for men. Yeah. And so I wonder, it seems to be something that's, odd in our culture where kind of it's almost like biology denialism like it's a, and again without taking an extremist reduction of biological biological reductionist position i'm big on culture i travel around the world i do see that culture makes a difference i do see there's an element to gender like anything else which is socially constructed you know and i see some similarities like me and my friend would be in ethiopia and we'd be hanging out and we'd be agreeing on like who were the most attractive women at the dance and we'd be uh, exhibiting value-based kind of behaviors, which would be like, okay, wow, that's a cool thing for a guy to do. Yeah, I agree with you. Even though he grew up in rural Ethiopia. And then there was some stuff that was real different, you know, some cultural stuff as an Ethiopian, as an English guy. Um, and it just seems like there's a denial of, of biology and a denial of the body at the heart of that, which seems to be in a particular kind of cultural trend right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think that there is perhaps a couple of things. One, like we've never had the power to determine our own destiny that we have currently. And so I think people are, are, are maybe they're, 
they're not wanting to see any constraints, right? And we also, you know, we're, we're, I think we're still stuck in this Cartesian dualism between the mind and the body. And so we identify ourselves as our minds. And then we want our minds to be these completely self-causing entities. But what's weird to me about that is that culture doesn't really do that, right? If everything's culturally determined, it's just as deterministic than if everything's biolo- uh, biologically yep. determined. It's like, you don't... There's something don't, quite juvenile, isn't it? Of like, I want to be free and my mind has to be free. But as you say, that doesn't make the mind free if it's culturally determined. Yeah. If, you know, if gender roles were perfectly culturally determined, there's no reason why you'd have homosexual and transsexual people, right? Because, you know, theoretically we have a homophobic, transphobic culture. So why would a transphobic and homophobic culture culturally construct people into those genders? Yeah. So there has to be something else going on. Right? It's also not the, I've worked quite a lot with gay community, particularly in Russia. I live in the gay capital of England and the experience I have of, of the, the, those people have, I talk to the gay people I speak to, they say, no, I've, I've always been this way. It feels biological. I've been this way since I was a kid. So, you know, that they're, they're telling me a biological story. Yeah. Uh, you know, my mentor, uh, when I was a kid was gay and he said he knew he was gay when he was six years old and he was, he was, uh, from a evangelical Christian family and he used to pray every night, try to pray the gay away and it didn't work. And you can uh, actually make a genetic case for homosexuality as well. That's the, there is some good cases for that, that I've seen. So if anyone's out there going, yeah, but how could you possibly have a gay gene? Yeah, you can have a gay gene. Well, homosexuality is actually kind of strange because, um, it's actually not that heritable. So it is heritable, but it's less heritable than a lot of other personality characteristics. I think the heritability of, or the concordance between identical twins for homosexuality, the, the heritability estimate for it ends up being about 17%. Whereas like, uh, you know, IQ is estimated to be heritable at somewhere between 50 to 80%. And what I notice, Rafe, is as you say this, I, I find my breathing contracting and it's like, <laughs> oh God, we're on dangerous territory. Literally, yeah, sorry, man. No, it's okay. But it's like literally all you're doing is, is stating facts, which I'm guessing you could back up, which you know, mm-hmm. you've had from a decent university education. This isn't just some crazy stuff you're pulling out your ass. I'm pretty confident. And it's like, wow, talking about facts, about biology, about heritability suddenly starts to feel dangerous. And, and, and I, I don't know, I feel like as soon as we make anything to do with the body, anything factual, bad and wrong to even talk about them, that, that's not good. Yeah, well, uh, one of the things Peterson says that I like is that if you, we have to tell the truth, right? And because if you don't tell the truth, then you, then, then instead of having reality behind you supporting you, you have reality confronting you. Right now, the thing about facts is that they don't. There's another thing Peterson says that I really like is that facts don't tell you how to interpret them. Right, mm-hmm. the fact that that homosexuality is more or less heritable, it really doesn't tell you anything about how you should treat someone who's homosexual. Right, if someone says I felt homosexual since I was seven years old, it's not like you're going to say, well, yeah, but the biology says that it's not that heritable. So you know, pray the gay away. <laughs> you know that doesn't work just because it's not there's a mistake that we make that something that is, um, that is not heritable is not biologically determined, right? There's three, there's three determinants of, of, uh, of behavior according to behavioral genetics. One is your, your, whatever happens before you come out of the womb, which is primarily genetic, but there's also uterine effects. So that's called, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, I can't remember the term off the top of my head, but that's your heritable factor. Then you have the the shared environment, which is your your parents and the environment you grew up in, and then the non shared environment. And non shared environment is actually everything that we don't know. And so, non shared environment could be peer group effects, it could be other biological causes, it could be pathogens, it could be you know anything that happens to you. So, so, so there's lots of things that could happen. Like there's some information that that homosexuality seems to have some sort of uh, uterine effect because it's much more common in in, in sons who have older brothers, or ch- right? So in, in men, um, if, if they're later born, they're more likely to be homosexual. So that's not a genetic effect, but it's probably a biological effect. It doesn't matter on the, it doesn't really matter too much on the level of the individual, right? You, you feel how you feel and people should, should give you the opportunity to express who you are as long as that's not damaging other people. Like our moral foundations in some sense, they don't need to be dependent on, on uh, they're not written into our evolution precisely. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So just to wrap up, we do need to be moving towards a close in, in a minute. There's lots of things we could talk about here. I mean, we've talked about kind of movement background, evolutionary background. You know, I like this idea of kind of movement culture, how that's developing. I mean, what do you think you're kind of most, I would say most expert on, but what for you is, um, what's your thing? Like, what's your real thing that you want to talk about and be like, yeah, this is something I can definitely contribute to the world about. Well, um, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit of, a, of, I try to, I try to have many things, so it's hard for me to, to narrow it down. I'm really passionate about getting people moving in trees. I'm really passionate about uh, rough and tumble play. And then I suppose what I'm currently most passionate about is, is, the, is, is helping people articulate their why in training, helping people recognize that that's the fundamental question is that it really doesn't, um, the what you should what you practice shouldn't be defined by what's external. It should be defined by how it impacts you in a broad way, right? The person you become. One of my favorite sayings is from the mountaineering community, and they say it's not what the man does to the mountain; it's what the mountain does to the man. And of course, that works if you're male or female. Um, but the idea is that the the thing that you get out of practice is not that you did something. It's that doing something changed who you are in a way that was meaningful to you. And that's, that's the thing that I think um, our culture is so focused on external rewards and external metrics that it's really easy to forget that. And I think people, if they don't understand their own why, they're not going to get to the best place for them. Uh, I had this conversation with AJ Roberts, who is the... Um, former world champion in the, uh, not world champion, sorry. I, I think he was a world champion, but he's the world record holder in the squat. So in powerlifting, he squatted more weight than anybody else. somewhere over 1,200 pounds. I don't know. So he basically told me that in order to break the world record, well, he had to eat himself up to 360 pounds at 5'9". So that's what, 160 kilos, something like that. Um, and that's at 1.75 meters. So he's medium high guy, extremely heavy. And he did that by eating constantly, which meant that he was shitting constantly, which was uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> so that was no fun. Um, and then he went into the gym and he beat the crap out of himself every day until his shoulders hurt and his knees hurt and his hips hurt. And then he would, in order to get himself to go to the gym the next day, he would have to work himself into a rage. So he was constantly angry, constantly hurting. He was so heavy that despite the fact that he was one of the best athletes in the world, in some sense, he got fatigued walking upstairs. Yeah. And you see that with a lot of extreme athletes, Olympic athletes, they're not actually healthy or fit in a general yeah. sense, right? No. So he's, he's unhealthy because of his practice. He's hurting. He's irritable and angry all the time. And he finally gets to the point where he breaks this world record and he doesn't feel anything. He doesn't feel anything. So then he decides that I'm going to break the world record again. That's, that's clearly the reason that I didn't feel anything this time is because I need to do it again. And so he goes through the process again. I think it was two more years. And he gets to the end of the process and he doesn't feel anything again. And then he realizes, okay, well, this is the wrong game. So now he weighs 240 pounds, you know, just over 100 kilos. And, um, and he can smash across at wad and he goes and gives inspirational speeches about how to, to overcome yourself. But the thing that struck me about that, and I've heard the same thing about a lot of Olympic athletes. You know, they spend their whole life prepping for this moment of getting the Olympics, and it's just it just fills them with nothingness when they get there. Yeah, it's like, huge oh, come down. Would you rather be a person who who was a world record holder who had done these incredible things, or would you rather be a person who who had who had lived a practice that made you experience the world as more meaningful, more deep, uh, more connected, day to day? And that, that fundamentally, I think, is the orientation that is, is appropriate for the vast majority of people in their practice. And it's something that, that's not really being taught and that most people don't understand. And practical stuff. So people listening to this, you know, some of them are dancers, martial artists, yoga people. Like, is there any kind of practical stuff you could offer people other than, you know, go try and clean trees and run and have some fun, which, uh, you know, I'm inspired by watching your stuff to just play around in the park near me. Is there anything you want to like offer people as a practice or as an encouragement? So find your why, you know, uh, what I would say about finding your why is play lots of games, right? You learn through playing. So go, go out and try something new, go do a parkour class, go, if you're a parkour athlete, go take a yoga class, go do some capoeira, go do some jujitsu, go take some dance, try to pl- play with a bunch of different things. Because if you don't have kind of multiple ways to test what is most meaningful to you, 
uh, then it's very easy to be misled. So go out there and, 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 and try a bunch of things out and play a lot of games until you find the games that are most meaningful to you and find the, the elements in the games that are most meaningful to you and then make that what your practice is about. And then as far as natural movement and how to get started on it, you know, what I always tell people is, um, especially if you're a novice, it's like, well, walk everybody, you know, this is less of a problem in, in the UK, but in, uh, in the States, man, people drive everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a friend of mine in America driving around the block for 20 minutes to find a parking space and we could have just walked, walked 10 minutes to get there. Yeah. So, so the thing is that you need to be able to, uh, well, the, it's the biggest missing movement nutrient. Basically we would be walking, you know, five to 10 miles a day in a hunter forager environment. And it, even as farmers, you know, you wouldn't walk as far, but you're walking back and forth, you know, taking care of the cows, going to the thing you're, you're walking all the time. It's, you just, it's how you fundamentally locomote most of the time. So walk every day. Um, I think, you know, sitting in chairs is, is a, a particularly destructive habit, not because the seated posture is bad for you, but because it's replacing so many other postures and because being able to move and be graceful and have mobility close to the ground is really important. And especially as people age when they're likely to fall and hit the yeah. ground, get on the they ground. Do. This is what I love about jujitsu and Aikido. It's like, get on the ground, move on the ground, you know, get used to getting up and down from the ground. That's, that's a big one, huh? Yep. So get on the ground and learn to fall, which again, judo, Aikido, yeah, learn to fall, but, uh, come train outside and learn to fall in concrete. Get away from that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, do that and then find some time to hang. Your shoulder needs to hang. Find some time to squat. Your hips and ankles need to squat. And then, you know, if you're healthy and you're fit and you're ready to, like go climb a tree. You, you are a primate. You'll figure it out. Just uh, be aware of whether it's run. Don't go too high up in the beginning. Um, don't go too far out on the limbs. Just stay close to the trunk. But, but start climbing and you'll find that your body naturally knows how to move in these spaces and that it's really engaging every class that when i teach my seminars i don't start with any technique i just take when i get to the tree part it's like i take the people and i put them in the trees and i say imagine you're a six-year-old and and you know immediately basically people are laughing and smiling and having a blast and they're doing tons of super diverse movement so it's like they don't actually need me to do that Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's permission, it permission isn't it? You know, like I'm in the park, there's a park near me and I'm just balancing on stuff and swinging from stuff and jumping. And it's just like, it's just permission. You know, this is part of me that's like, oh, I'm going to get arrested or something here. And I mean, I'm breaking anything. I'm not hurting anyone, but it's, uh, it's easy to get into a kind of conformist movement mindset. Yeah. So, so yeah, permission, give yourself permission to go climb a tree and, and, uh, and realize that, you know, if every kid found it fun forever and people find it fun because if you didn't find it fun, you wouldn't have kept practicing it and kept yourself alive when we lived in trees. It's probably going to be fun for you. Uh, so just be safe and, and get started. And then the other one is, is, is you find some way to physically touch and move with another human being, whether it's tango or jujitsu or contact improv, whatever it is, you need that. You need to to develop rhythm, you need to develop sensitivity, you need to develop your motor maps through movement with other human beings. And, uh, and no, like 15 minutes in your bedroom with your partner three times a week is not enough. Uh, yeah. It is. And it, there is to me something that I miss when I just do yoga is, is the, that I really miss from Aikido and Tango is that movement with a partner and the complexity of movement and the, the skills that get built that don't get built through doing a solitary practice. Um, you know, for me, there's also something here about like tuning in to what's alive for you now. Like, you know, for a long time, Aikido is my sweet spot. And then it was like, you know, I went to a class of tango and all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, beautiful women in dresses and high heels and it smells good and music and it's sensual and it's flirty and it's, there's music and it's an entire, and, it all, and that was like for a year or two, that was all I wanted to do, you know? And if I'd have just been like, no, I do Aikido, that's my thing. I'm going to go to class again. There's something about diversity of practice and just, just by tuning into what brings you alive. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, to quote Peterson one more time, he talks about this. We have an instinct for meaning, right? When you feel like something's meaningful and you feel like you're aligned, that's a signal that you're in the right place and you should pay attention to that and you should do the things that you feel like make you stronger. And I think that within physical practice, you have to, you have to recognize that, um, well, there's, there's two, there's two traps. There's the trap of the, the generalist and the trap of the specialist. The trap of the specialist is it's scary to go back to being a novice. Mm -hmm. The trap of the generalist is 
when I reach a plateau, well, I can go do something else and learn quickly in that space, right? So maybe I, I can do mountain biking and then when it gets hard, I'll go do surfing. And then when that gets hard, I'll do, yeah. go do skiing. It's like the and guy who has a new girlfriend because it's exciting and never gets married and gets the depth, right? Exactly. So we, we want to balance that. You want to have, you want to have the, the things that you're willing to, to, to do the hard labor for, right? Find something that you're willing to suffer for because you'll learn from it and it will give more meaning to your life over the long term. But don't do that thing to the exclusion of everything else you could learn. Don't do that thing because it's comfortable just to be in that thing. Like regularly put yourself outside of it. So I, I like to think of myself as a generalist with specialties. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I, can, I can lift heavy weights. I can run pretty fast. I can do handstands. I can do all these things. But the things that I'm really good at is I'm really good at kickboxing and I'm really good at tree climbing and moving in nature, parkour in nature. And, and what I'm always trying to do is like make myself a little bit broader, right? So right now I'm going to be taking some jujitsu classes and some hip hop dance classes, and that's going to be widening out my, my physical base. I've done jujitsu before, um, but I'm more, more striking oriented. Yeah. So it's like, I need to, I need to develop that. I need to develop uh, some more dance, but then at the same time, it's like, I'm, I'm still in that gym practicing jumps, practicing swings, just trying to, to break that next level in, in my, my movement practice. I'm tr- still trying to, to do something and uh, I'm still going to be going out into the trees and climbing the trees. Right. So, so I think that's a, a good way to do it. And, and there's a cyclical nature to it. Right. I think this is really important. Your practice won't look the same all the time. So don't expect it to right? Sometimes you're going to want more structure. Sometimes you need to be more playful. Sometimes you're going to be in love with tango. Sometimes you're going to be in love with Aikido. It's like, don't, don't throw Aikido away because you're not as in love with it right now. But if you're really attracted to tango, it's like, well, listen to that and just find a little bit of a balance. Yeah. I have kind of like two long-term wives, like two long-term practices that I'm, you know, have that long-term commitment to. And occasionally I give them up for a few months or the maximum a year, but generally I'm doing them fairly consistently. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a practice each year and go into a new practice. And I find a, a year at a couple of times a week is, or two or three times a week is enough to give me a, a little bit of a good, like a good taste of it, not just to flirt with it. Um, and then I kind of cycle that in and then do the other thing of just like doing new stuff. Like if I'm at a festival and I go, Hey, I want to try that. I've never tried that, you know, like being open to new things, but not letting go of those core practices either. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're going to try something new, we'll try it and see if you like it. But if you, if you decide that you like it, you got to commit to a specific period of time. Yeah. I'd say minimum is really about 12 weeks because that's about how long it really takes to make lasting neurological change in the brain. So if you, if you, if you decide to take that jujitsu class or capoeira class, it's like three months, that's your commitment. If you make it through three months, you'll be, you'll have gained something worthwhile, even if you stop. Yeah. Okay. We need to wrap up. Just seen the time. I need to get to my Aikido class, actually walking up, okay, walking cool. up the hill to my Aikido class. Um, so this has been a real pleasure, man. Where can people find out more about you if they want to look you up? Yeah. So, um, I have a website, evolvemoveplay.com. It's got all my upcoming seminars in it on it. I'll be traveling all around the world, teaching, um, multi uh, two day or seven day seminars. Um, uh, I'm really excited with my 20, 2018 schedule. The biggest one that I, well, let me highlight a couple. Um, we're doing two uh, natural movement in bushcraft uh, seminars that are week long. One in Borneo, where we'll be staying in tree houses, and that's with Wood wow. Smoke, based out of the uh, the UK, and then one in Namibia. And we'll be working with uh, also with Lee Saxby, uh, who's one of the foremost barefoot running coaches as well. So we'll be doing persistence hunting and barefoot running in the mornings. We'll be doing bushcraft skills in the afternoon, uh, uh, in in the in the midday and then in the afternoon we'll be doing natural movement skills in namibia um so that's going to be really cool so check those out you can look at woodsmoke.co.uk to find those or you can find them through my website and then i'm teaching uh two big seminars this year in the northwest uh one's called the journey and that's for intermediate and advanced uh athletes and then one's called the gathering which is for all levels and all ages and those are those are uh, we stay at my family property in the Skagit Valley, which is these incredible houses built by my dad. They've been featured in the New York Times. They're, you know, 
they're crazy cob structures with thatched roofs and dragon heads sticking out of them. And we have uh, saunas and paw cold plunges and any number of cool things. Uh, if you've seen my videos and you like the environments that I train in, we're going to basically be going to all the best places. So we'll be climbing through the waterfalls. We'll be jumping through the trees. We'll be going down to the beach. If you're into any of that stuff, this is the place to come to. Uh, it's my favorite thing of the year. There's something that happens when you put together a group of people aimed towards the same goal and have them overcome their fears, learn together, and then spend time together eating and taking saunas and talking. It's like you, you get a tribal experience that's so meaningful to people. And uh, it's, it's what people are really craving. We really are too isolated in this world. And, and going out and, and making something more of yourself with a group of people and connecting to nature is hugely meaningful. So I highly recommend that. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Twitter. And I'll be, I'm actually starting a podcast series of my own. So I'll be doing, doing lots of podcasting uh, this winter and you can find that on uh, YouTube and then we'll put it on iTunes eventually as well. So that's kind of the, the breakdown. Great, Rafe. Lots of good stuff. Sounds like some serious high end, very cool retreats there as well. So it's yeah. been great to have you on. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embodied Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body.